A new documentary tells the real-life story of twins, one of whom lost his memory after a motorcycle accident and recognised no one except his twin brother. Alex Lewis was 18 when he woke from a coma, not even knowing his name. He relied on Marcus to help rebuild his memories from scratch. But what he didn't realise was that Marcus had decided not to remind him about a shocking family secret. Let's take a look at a clip from the Netflix documentary, Tell Me Who I Am. If he hadn't known who I was, then he would have been all alone in the world. But he wasn't alone in the world, he had me. I started piecing things together. He would give me a photo, and I would construct a memory around that, and life seemed good. Privileged family, normal parents, he painted an idyllic picture. But I was never questioning anything. I had no reason to doubt it. Well, Alex and Marcus Lewis are the twins who wrote the book that formed the basis of that documentary, and they are here with me now. Hello to you both, Hello, Alex Rosa. and Marcus. Um, I watched the documentary yesterday, and I have to say it is one of the most harrowing and heartbreaking pieces of television I have ever seen as you take the viewers through your story and the journey that, that you go on, Alex. Let's, let's start at the beginning of this story uh, as it is. Um, you're 18 years old, yeah. you're out on your motorbike and you have a horrific accident. You're in a coma then for three months? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's about, so we never really know, but it's about th three and a half weeks to, to a month or something right. like that. Right, and when you wake from that coma, I just, you have nothing. I have nothing at all. I just see my twin brother on, opposite me. I immediately say his name. Um, so I think I'm OK. And then I see my mother then comes up to the bed and I have no idea who she is. And she starts stressing me out. So I turn to Marcus and say, who's that lady? And he says, don't you know? I said, that's your mother. And that's when I realise that, that actually something's not right. And then Marcus says to me, do you actually know your own name? And I say, no, I don't. So that's how it started. So for you, your mind is entirely blank, apart from yeah, it, Marcus. Yeah. And, and Alex then relies on you completely, Marcus, to, to rebuild those memories. Yeah, so when he woke up and I realised that he just knew absolutely nothing at all and we had to start from scratch, so he had to learn what a hospital was, what a bed was, what um, shoes are, how to do shoelaces. I had to teach him everything about his house, his bedroom, even his, own, even his girlfriend. I mean, everything was gone. Um, so I was the one that was kind of leading him through that and helping him along the way. So, you, as Marcus is saying, you go home from hospital, but you have no idea no, where I'm, you are. I'm going in a, in a car with a strange woman to a strange house and everything is new. But I've got a quite, I'm, I'm 18 years old, but I've probably got a mental age of six, seven, eight year old. So I'm quite low, so I'm not asking many questions and everything's very basic to start with. Uh, and so, Marcus, these, these questions come to you. You are everything mm. to Alex. Mm. And you have a decision to make about the picture that you paint for him. Well, it, it, it was a gradual thing. So obviously, as his mental age grew over the couple of weeks, um, I would then, he would be asking me slightly more difficult questions once we got past the basic stuff. And it wasn't until he started asking slightly more difficult questions like, you know, what are our mum and dad like? You know, did we go on holidays? Things like that. That I had to start saying, I wasn't kind of, you know, I started making it up and saying, well, yeah, you know, we used to go on lots of holidays. We used to. So I was, I had to make a conscious decision once I'd gone in too far to actually change the narrative, which I decided that I wanted to do. And because you have no memories, photographs become really important and they start to form your image of what your childhood was like with the help of Marcus. One photograph I think we've got of you on a childhood holiday. And, and Marcus, Alex is joining the dots and creating a, an innocent vision of, of what childhood is like. Yeah. And... So I, because he I was asking me about holidays, I managed to find a holiday that we'd been on with some friends because we didn't go on family holidays. And there was a picture of us in the sand um, was two young boys, and so I showed him the picture and said, look, this is one of the family holidays. Um, our, our stepfather spoke French, so I said it was a French holiday. 
he then accepted that that's what we did for our, in when we were young, and then he moved on to other questions. So it was all part of the narrative that I was feeding him to give him a happy childhood. But I, but I wasn't challenging him on more difficult questions. I just wanted simple answers, put it in the memory bank, fill in the jigsaw puzzle and move on. Because in, in, in anybody else, there would have been potentially signs that would have raised suspicions. For yeah. example, your, your living arrangements, you two lived yeah. in, in an outbuilding. Yes, we With... lived, we lived, um, well, <laughs> it, it sounds quite horrific, but we did live in a very large house, but we lived in an outbuilding to it. The two of you together, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you had very limited access to the main house. Yes, yeah. yeah, we had very limited, but for us, it was, um, you know, we called it the shed, it was a glorified shed. And, um, but we had, free, we had a certain amount of freedom to be in there, so we could do what we wanted in the way so we weren't in the house itself. Your relationship with your stepfather was, was difficult? Yeah, he was quite... Um, well, he was a very difficult man. He was a very strict man, very, very Victorian sort of upbringing. You stood up when he walked in the room, you called him sir, you shook his hand, you only went into his quarters of the house when you were invited, and you did what you were told. And with your mum, you obviously didn't know her when you came round from the coma, but you, you grew to love her. I did, and I only knew her for 12 years of my life. Um, so I did, I was told she was my mother, and I grew very fond of her, and I grew to love her. Because I had told him nice things about her. So he knew that, um, that she was, you know, he had to start to have a relationship with her. When your father, your stepfather died, you, you thought things would start to change in your life, and that the, the rules, the very strict rules by which uh, you were governed, would go, and, and that didn't happen, did it? No, I think, I, from what I understood about the family, it was always about him, and he was the one who had, who had laid all the rules down. But it turned out it wasn't, and it actually got worse after he died, and our mother put more stringent rules in. No front door key, you can't have this, you can't have that, you have to tell us when you're coming and when you're going, and, and, and that was surprising. And, and uh, at any point were the questions becoming more difficult for yes they got they got more and more difficult and I had then the lies and the story had to get more and more creative so that became an issue for me over the years and to the point where I just stopped kind of you know I just st you know we got as far as we could go with and his mental age had come back up to a sort of normal age so it, it, it just we just followed that narrative through till he was 32 years old at which point your mother died and then five years later, yeah, she, she dies. She had a brain tumour and she died quite quickly. And that was when everything changed because I cried because I learned to, this, to, to love this lady and nobody else did. And that was strange. My brother had a completely opposite reaction to me. I didn't expect that. And that got me thinking that something was wrong. And that was the start of my next journey. So it started at 18 and then the next journey started at 32. And they literally had to start again, almost from ground zero. And so you started to clear the house? We started to clear the house up. She was, a, she was an antique dealer, she was a hoarder. So there was, you know, it took, it took us a year to, to clear the house, um, which was quite an arduous job. We used to do it sort of every weekend. And as you were doing this, Marcus, did you fear that some of those secrets which, which you had kept from Alex would be revealed? Um, I, I, I get the back of my mind, I was fearing that, but I was feeling that probably, I couldn't imagine that there was anything in the house that would kind of lead towards it, not realising that, you know, there was. And, um, and if, you know, if I'd found all of that stuff before, I probably could have dealt with it, but it all happened, you know, in, with us both present. Yeah, um, there was, and you see in the documentary, there was a, a cupboard within a cupboard, a secret cupboard, it was locked away. And you opened it and found something horrific. And we found, <clears throat> yeah, and that changed everything. We found this photograph of um, two naked boys, which was us, aged about 10, and our heads had been cut off, and it was placed singly in a drawer. And then I started getting very confused. And then I started really asking questions about what's going on here. And that's when, that's when everything flipped, and then, um, I went to see some counselling, tried to work out what was going on, and that's when I challenged Marcus. For the first time in my life, I went and challenged him and said, is this, you know, were we abused by our mother or not? It was a simple question, and he just nodded his head. There was no... He just gave me the recognition that, that this extraordinary thing, statement I was making was actually true,
because I just didn't believe it was. And, and presumably you didn't want no, to believe. No, no, I couldn't believe it was. And I didn't even know why I was asking the question because it just seemed too far fetched for this idyllic life that I'd been living. And then when he nodded, um, my world changed in that instant. And we both remember that, that second to this day. Um, Nothing was ever the same after that. Marcus, when he asked you that question, what went through your head? Mass panic. I think panic and fear that the kind of this story that I created over so many years, which had also allowed me to forget and allowed me to be free. So it was a two-way thing in a way, so that um, the more I gave him a fantasy life, I was giving myself a fantasy life. So I was living quite a sort of normal life in that sense. And then when he came and said to me, you know, that, you know, did, did our mother abuse us? And I had, to, I had nowhere else to go with a question like that. It was so frontal that I just nodded and said yes. But I was, it's, I had so much fear inside me that I couldn't give him anything more than that. So it was just a one word answer and then I left it. It was a the Pandora's box, it had been opened, but that you wanted to slam it shut I again. wanted to open it, yeah. give him a one word answer and slam it and bury it in a tonne of concrete. I just couldn't bear the thought of. I didn't have the strength, I didn't have the will to deal with it. So I just hid and I was quiet and I was silent. Let's have a little look at a bit more from that documentary. I, from day one, painted a picture of a normal family, but none of that was true. It was a fantasy that I was creating for him. How could we have secrets? We don't have secrets. The one person that I absolutely trusted has betrayed me. <sighs> I just cried and cried. For days. I have been lying for 20 years. Alex and Marcus Lowe are still with me. And um, before we went to the break, we talked about the moment that you discovered the truth about your past, that you had been abused by your mother. And as we saw in that clip, Alex, just, just talk us through how you felt to learn that that had been held from you? It was, I mean, it's emotional just watching it just mm. there, just that clip, but it was just, my whole world was just was shattered in that one instant and, <clears throat> and I just broke down. I mean, I couldn't work, I couldn't do anything. It took me quite some time just to grab the enormity of a story this big inside this idyllic family that I lived in. And my mind was going mad with what's real, what isn't real. Are my parents my parents? Is, what, what's, what, is anything true? So it was enormous section for me. It was the first time that we had ever um, argued or got upset with each other. So that took some doing as well. As, as twins, you were incredibly close. You'd shared everything. And this is something you hadn't been able to share with him, Marcus. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, twins, are, they, we work on a kind of unique bond. So, you know, normal siblings, we kind of refer it to the normal siblings have a a sort of 100% connection, and twins have 110%. And we operate in the 10%, um, and we've always done that. So we always kind of think about things in the same way, do everything, we work together, we've always done everything. Um, so when this revelation happened, we lost, the, we lost not only the 10%, we lost the 100%, we lost everything. Um, but that didn't last for that long. Alex got over the initial bit within a month, I think. He was angry with me, really quite strongly for at least a month, and then it's, we slowly got it back together. So we managed to get 100% back together, but we never achieved to get the 10% the that we were missing as identical twins. And, and, and you said you, you, you'd replied just by nodding and then silence. Did you, at that point, talk any more? No, I gave him, I felt, you know, he asked me a question, I gave him an answer, which was a nod, and yes, our mother abused us. And then I think for the next 20 odd years, I didn't, I didn't give him any more information because I wasn't capable of giving it to him. It was just too painful for me and I wanted to just run back into my shell and be silent and quiet. So it was a, you know, when I look back on it now, I really, we should have just sat down and had a chat, but we, ne we didn't do that. Because I think abuse and, and child abuse is such a strong thing in everybody. And, and, and I was carrying it for both of us. So I was carrying all my pain and all his pain and it was just too much for me to cope with. So I just. I just went quiet. 
In the final part of the documentary, we see you coming together, sitting down together and confronting the truth about your past. What was that like for you, Alex, to, to get answers to the questions you had for the first time, but also to hear things that presumably you never wanted? Well, it was, it was quite scary because I kind of knew what was coming because we'd obviously written a book mm -hmm. sort of five years before and um, where he had indicated most of that stuff. But I'd actually rebuilt that back up as a monster in my head because I only had tip bits and... Um, it was a bit ambiguous. And it was quite ambiguous and the way it had been written down and, and the way I had it. But what I really wanted, more than anything, was to just have my twin tell me directly himself what, he, how, what his feelings were and what really happened. So I actually wanted to make it smaller. So it wasn't a, such a great shock when he told me, but it was an enormous release that I finally had. And that's what actually all I ever wanted was him to just sit down and tell me, which didn't take very long. And for you to sit down and, and tell Alex, was that, as Alex describes it, a release? Or, or for you, did it mean you had to relive it all? No, yeah, it was a, it was a release. I mean, we started making the documentary and this then, it then became not about the documentary, it just became about us because I suddenly mm. realised we had an opportunity which we hadn't really properly explored. explored. Yeah. Yeah. It became a form of therapy it for was you. A, it was a form of therapy, <laughs> and it was really the last day of the shoot when we were sitting in the studio that all, we stripped out the cameras and, and everything else, and it was just us talking, and it, suddenly we were, for the first time, sitting opposite each other, having a grown-up conversation about it, which we should have done, you know, 20 years before, and it was really quite sort of... It was just really silly that, we'd, you know, we're both so close. But we did finally get the closure that we were after. And it was amazing. It was a little split second right at the end where that we, we got our 10% back, which has been incredible for us. Looking back, Marcus, would, would you change anything about the way in which you dealt with this? Well, that's a good question. I think, right. I think looking back on it now and doing what we've done and speaking to people we've spoken about and finding the reaction that we've had to the, to the movie, I think I should have, I, I would have, if I'd had the courage, I would have spoken 20 years before and not put him through all the anguish for 20 years. But you still would have painted this picture of I his still, I, I, I would have given him what, what, we, what I call a free pass. So he had, you know, many blissful years. He didn't need of to a know. a free pass that he didn't need to know. And that for me was a gift and that was a free pass that he had. Yes, it was a lie. Yes, it was made up. Yes, it was very upsetting for him to understand that. But I think that, you know, for me, I would, I would never change that. I would do that in a heartbeat again. Have you, through the course of this, Alex, put yourself in Marcus's shoes and asked yourself what, what you would have done? Mm, and I, I think if I'd had the strength, which I don't think I would have had as been as good at it as him, and I would have liked to think that I would have done the same. To protect him? Yeah. I, I didn't notice till that moment in the movie that I did, had never really taken on board the amount of of anguish that he'd, he'd, he was doing. I, de I never really appreciated what he'd done for me until then. It was a real light bulb moment. He never realised what I wanted and I never realised what he'd given. It's amazing, really, that we just never did it until that moment. And, and tell me now, having confronted this together, what life is like for you? I, I'd sort of say from that moment on, we're done. I mean, we, went, we met each other afterwards. We walked outside and we just looked at each other and we said, are we good? And we said, yeah, we're good. And we went home. And we've never spoken about it since, and probably never will. So for us, the story is over. But we, both, the most you know, we both have wives, we're both happily married, we both have two kids who are both, all, both the same age. Your families are very close. Your families are very that, close. That we still throughout. work in our businesses together. So life is looking much more... Um, simple. Simple now. Yeah, yeah. To have done this, as you, you described Marcus so powerfully, it, it almost became not about the documentary, this was just about the two of you, but to then see it on the screen and to have other people watching your story for the first time, how does that feel? Well, it's, it's an added bonus. I mean, we hadn't realised how big it was all going to get. We didn't realise the power that the, the documentary was going to have on people. And, you know, it having done sort of film festivals and have people coming up and, and telling us their stories, people telling us stuff that they've never told anybody in their lives, you suddenly realise that actually people just need to talk. And, and what we've really learned is that being silent is not, you know, you've just, we've just got to break the silence. We've all got to have a conversation. 
And we want people to engage in a conversation and maybe watch the documentary, go for a dinner party, have a conversation with a friend and they tell you that they were abused and you just have a conversation about it. Okay. Um, it's been an absolute privilege to meet you. Alex and Marcus Lewis, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us on.